good evening everyone so today we will start with the next topic So we will be starting with the next topic, UV visible spectroscopy. Okay. As the name suggests, in this spectroscopic method, we have two types of electromagnetic radiations which will uh, which are involved. The first one is UV radiations, and the second one is visible light. So UV radiations, they are basically in the region of say 160 nanometers to 400 nanometer wavelength range. Whereas the visible light radiation, it is in the range of 400 nanometer to 800 nanometer. Okay. And as we all, all know that the visible light, they can be broken down into Vibgyor components, okay? <clears throat> so, in our last class, we have discussed that what is spectroscopy? Spectroscopy is nothing but the understanding of electromagnetic interactions of the electromagnetic radiation with a matter. Okay. Similarly, in this case, UV, UV visible spectroscopy uh, method, it means the interaction of the UV electromagnetic radiation with the matter is studied over here. Now the matter, it can be either in gaseous form, liquid form, or solid form. In case of solid, it is usually reflective spectroscopy. Okay, whereas Majorly in the case of gaseous and liquid systems, we mainly implement transmittance spectroscopy. Okay. So in transmittance spectroscopy, what is the general uh, idea over here? The general idea is that you have a radiation source. Say this is the radiation source. Then you have the matter over here the radiation it falls onto the matter and then it is reflected over a detector okay. and the analysis is being made okay so if you see both the radiation source and the detector they are on the same side of the matter okay whereas in the transmission spectroscopy we have the radiation source. Now this is this is the matter, and then you have the detector. They are on the either side of the matter. <clears throat> Depending upon the nature of the spectroscopy, there will be different types of optical elements in between the radiation source and the matter and matter and the detector okay similarly over here also there will be various optical elements which can which help us in uh, establishing that proper interaction between the radiation or the electromagnetic radiations and the matter it happens okay <clears throat> now as i told you that the wavelength region in which the UV, UV visible spectroscopy work is in the range of 
usually 200 nanometer to 800 nanometer in uh, some sophisticated uh, uv visible spectroscopes it can come down to 116 nanometer okay not below the 116 nanometer in some of the in many of the uh, uv visible spectroscopes you may find that the uv range it starts from 180 nanometer okay now once we have known that uh, this is the uh, wavelength region where we would be looking uh, into under this uv visible spectroscopy we need to understand what are the radiation sources so if you see i talked about two types of re electromagnetic radiations one is the uv visible uh, uv uh, uv ultraviolet region and the other is, is the visible region so accordingly there would be two sources one for the uv region and one for the visible region there are no sources which can cover both the ultraviolet and the visible region okay in the uv radiation is being generated using the hydrogen lamp and it generates the uv radiations in the wavelength range of 180 and 350 nanometer okay there is another uh, radiation source uv radiation source and that is deuterium lamp okay and in the deuterium lamp we would have the wavelength range in the range of 160 nanometer and 400 nanometer okay in the current day uv visible spectroscopes you will find that deuterium lamp it is the most commonly used uv radiation source okay on the contrary we can also have the second type of radiation source this was the first one the second type is the visible radiation source in the visible radiation source we usually use tungsten filament in condensate lamp and it generates uh, radiations in the range of 350 to 2500 nanometer however as i said to you that visible spectroscopy it works up to the range of 800 nanometer because up to that we are having the visible region and beyond this region we are having the infrared rays so if you see over here there is a large portion of infrared radiations which are being generated using this tungsten filament incandescent lamp okay since we are having a large portion which is generating the ir radiations through this tungsten filament incandescent lamp so over here what happens is that only the 15 percent of the radiant energy of the total radiation generated by this tungsten filament lamp it falls within the visible region okay so we can use only this 15 percent which is in the visible portion and the all other radiation it is mostly in the ir range okay so ir if you see irs they are basically associated with the heating okay ir radiations they are associated with the heating and they are long wavelength uh, electromagnetic radiations as compared to the visible radiations and uh, they are mainly used for use for heating and care must be taken while uh, we are using uh, this kind of field of uh, radiations okay now there is another visible radiation source it is the xenon discharge lamp and it can cover 
most of the uv visible radiations 185 to 2000 nanometer however <clears throat> the cost of this lamp is very high and also in this case in both the cases uv visible radiation the uh, uh, this visible radiation which are being generated by the tungsten filament in incandescent lamp and the heat absorbing filter uh, and the xenon discharge filter if you see a large portion of the light uh, not the, the radiation it is being in the ir radiation range we have to use heat absorbing filter so that there is not much uh, heat which is being generated within the enclosure of the uv visible spectrophotometer okay so what is the take out from here the take out from the here the current day uh, uv visible spectrophotometers they usually use deuterium uh, deuterium lamp they are also called d2 lamp in short d2 lamp and they use tungsten filament lamps okay for the commonly used uh, research grade uv visible spectrophotometers okay so the xenon discharge lamp it uses a lot of um, what do you call it generates a lot of uh, heat and also its cost is very high so because of this reason this xenon discharge lamp they are not commonly used while designing the uv visible ready uh, uv visible spectrophotometer okay now apart from this radiation sources we have collimating systems so what are these collimating systems they are nothing but the optical systems which are used in a spectrophotometer okay so typically if you go by the what do you call the definition of the collimating system or a collimator as per the dictionary it says generation of the parallel rays okay so these optical systems they are basically used to channelize the radiations channelize the radiations in this case it is the electromagnetic radiations so that it can properly interact with the matter and accordingly after the interaction of the matter they can be affected Now the residual electromagnetic radiations they can be effectively detected by a detector. Okay. okay. So in different types of spectrometers, you will find different types of collimating systems. However, in the case of UV visible spectrophotometer, you will be finding that the different types of collimating systems they include lenses. they includes mirrors and they include slits okay so the lenses they basically helps in condensing the electromagnetic radiations in this case uv visible light okay then mirrors we all know mirrors they are used for the reflection of electromagnetic radiations and lastly slits slits are nothing but small openings which allow a portion of light to pass through okay and this slits they play an important role in converting a polychromatic light
polychromatic light or polychromatic radiations to a monochromatic radiations. Here in I am writing it as light, okay? Because light is also an EMR. And in this case, we are using the uh, UV and visible uh, radiations, okay? So the slits, they are responsible for converting a polychromatic light to a monochromatic light. So in our last class, we have discussed what is a polychromatic and what is monochromatic. Can anyone please repeat that for me? What is a polychromatic light and what is a monochromatic light? So polychromatic light means it involves a different range of uh, frequency or wavelengths uh, in a light. Uh, yeah. yeah. So basically this polychromatic, this chromatic word, this chromatic word, it comes from the word chroma. And chroma is basically associated with the word color. Okay. Now we all know a specific color. Say if it is a red, uh, red color, it is having a specific wavelength. Okay. So when we talk about polychromatic, that means it is having multiple colors. Okay. And if you are talking about multiple color, that means it is also constituted with multiple wavelengths. Okay. Whereas monochromatic, it means only one specific wavelength. But uh, ideally it is monochromatic would be only one wavelength, but it would be a group of wavelengths which is having very narrow bandwidth. Okay. Bandwidth means say the region say lambda 1 to lambda 2 with a central uh, central wavelength of lambda c. So this lambda 1 to lambda 2, it may be the difference would be say 10 nanometer to 15 man nanometer or so. Okay. So it is a very narrow band of wavelengths or the light wavelength which we use. And these can be generated using the slates. Now coming to the uh, lenses, so what are these lenses? Lenses, they are basically made up of glass, okay? They are basically made up of glass. And here we use silicate glass, which is working in the range of 350 nanometer to 3000 nanometer. And if we use silicate glass, our spectrophotometer, it will only be working in the visible region. And the spectrometer would be named as visible spectrometer. Okay. If the lenses are made with uh, made up of quartz, which are basically crystalline silica and fused silica, which is basically non-crystalline silica glass. And in these two types of uh, glasses, what happens? Your uh, wavelength, uh, this thing, it starts from uh, these glasses. They are able to handle the wavelength starting from 210 nanometer. Okay. So 210 nanometer to 3000. So if you want to develop a UV visible spectrophotometer, then you need to use quartz and or fused silica. Based optics. Okay. Are you getting my point? So, if you want to design a UV visible spectrophotometer, then you have to use the optics which are made up of quartz and or fused silica. Okay. Say for example, I give you a question. 
develop a visible uh, or not develop uh, you give the block diagram for a visible spectrophotometer then in that case you have to mark the optics as the silicate glass based optics okay whereas if i ask you give a block diagram of the construction of a uv visible spectrophotometer then over there you have to specifically mention that herein we have to use quartz or few silica based optics so that our spectrophotometer works in both the uv region and the visible region okay then the third part is prisms why prisms are used anyone can anyone tell me why prisms are used to convert polychromatic light to monochromatic light no incorrect <laughs> it it helps in a but it does not convert now prisms what do they do they helps us in separating the uh, this different bands of the uh, this uh, polychromatic light okay so you have a prism you pass the polychromatic light it passes through the prism then you will be having a band of wavelengths or different color of lights you will be getting over here okay but it is not helping you in getting the monochromatic light okay so a combination when you are trying to select a particular wavelength light then you have to use a combination of the prism and the slit see i have written over here allow a portion of light to pass through okay so a combination of the prism and a slit it can help you to get a monochromatic light i hope you have understood this okay then we have mirrors how are the mirror used in the mirrors the mirrors which are used in spectrophotometer they are front surface mirrors that means if you have a glass the outer part of the glass it is aluminized okay why it is aluminized because in the conventional mirror you will find this aluminization is on the other side or on the back side of the glass okay so you have the radiation source then this radiation source it goes over here it passes through the glass then it strikes into the aluminum region and then it comes back however this glass it can absorb some it can absorb some radiations and also there will be some refractions when the light is being coming out so it will become very difficult to channelize the electromagnetic radiations or the lights okay so to avoid these disadvantages this front surface aluminized mirrors they are being used then there are uh, another type of mirror which are called half silver mirrored so they are basically used in double beam instruments and they help in splitting a beam suppose there is a radiation over here light source is over here it is coming and if you are putting a this half silver mirror it will allow 50% of the light to pass through and it will reflect 50% of the light on the other side okay and we will look into its application when uh, 
uh, when these are used, now what happens? Okay, and how they are useful in developing these double beam instruments. Then <clears throat> magnesium fluoride is coated over the mirrors to reduce the scattering due to the reflections. Okay, then slits, polychromatic light radiation to monochromatic radiation. It is being carried out by the slits, as I told you. And there can be two types of slits. One is entry slit and another is exit slit. Okay. Another important thing which I forgot to mention is that whatever the glasses we are using, whether it is, it is lenses, whether it is mirrors, whether it is slits, in all these cases, the absorption should be less than 0.2% in the application wavelength range. Okay. That means these has to be very top quality glasses. Okay. Now this is a very interesting uh, chart, and this chart is called color wheel chart. Can anyone tell me why I have kept it over here? Any idea? Has anyone heard about this color wheel? Yes, sir. Hmm. Please tell me, sir. Uh, sir, it shows what color we will get after like we mix two colors on the edges, like from the first triangle. Sir, can... And any colors? Uh huh. So the red, Please. blue, and uh, yellow are the primary colors, and the other ones mm -hmm. are the secondary colors, which we get after mixing with some certain values mm -hmm. of three of them. Mm -hmm. So, uh, how it may help us? Any idea? Okay. Here, then, I have drawn this, uh, I have shown this uh, color wheel chart because it is a very important. Um, chart okay so before we go into the analysis of any uh, what do you call uh, analysis of the uh, this any sample we need to understand this what you have told it is correct uh, that rgb are the uh, primary colors and when we mix different things it will give us an idea about what are the different colors which are being presented. But another important thing is that. Is that it also gives us the complementary colors. Say. If you consider this red light. Or red color. The complementary color of red is green. OK. This orange color. Its complementary color is blue and so on. And they appear exactly 180 degree apart. OK, so suppose you want to. Block the. Red color. What you have to do? You have to apply the green color. That means if you use a green color filter, it will be completely blocking out the red color. OK, similarly, if you have an orange color. Filter that orange color filter will completely block out the blue color. OK, obviously there are some shades of oranges as you see over here. There are certain shades, so these shades uh, will be blocking different kinds of shades. OK. 
so i am not going into that so if you minutely move uh, from one color to the other there will always be a complementary color which can be used to block the specific um, color okay so it will only block this say this orange color filter it will block only the blue color however it will allow all the other colors to pass through okay so this is the importance of the color wheel chart and you should at least know the complement colors of the rgb and also the yellow so this the complement colors of this rgb why you should know okay because these are very um, uh, common colors which appear in our Uh, daily life and uh, you should know the complementary colors of these colors okay. now coming to the monochromators okay so what are monochromators as i told you previously monochromators are nothing but they convert polychromatic light i am using this short form pc stands for polychromatic light monochromatic light okay so how you can do you can use certain filters which can transmit only limited wavelength region to pass through okay then types of filters the types of filters could be glass filter gelatin filter and interference filters glass filter it is very easy to prepare when you are preparing some glasses you put uh, some metal ions which have their own color and it will give their color impart their color to the glasses and you get colored glasses and these colored glasses they have a bandwidth of 20 to 50 nanometer and if you use cobalt it will give you a blue color glass if you use copper it will give you blue green color glass if you use manganese it will give you purple color glass if you use iron it will give you green color glass if you use cadmium it will give you yellow color glass okay then gelatin filters what are gelatin filters i hope every one of you know what are, what is a gelatin gelatin is nothing but it is obtained from collagen and it is again uh, another protein which is commonly used and it is a genetically uh, conserved protein okay genetically genetically conserved protein and it, it has been used in various uh, biomedical applications for, uh, for tissue engineering drug delivery and many other applications okay so over here what happens is that this gelatin it is dissolved in water okay and we get a gelatin solution then some dyes are being added so when some dyes are added it gives a specific color to the gelatin solution okay now this solution it is used to develop gelatin sheets which are basically sandwiched between the glass filters okay the bandwidth of this filter is 10 to 30 nanometer which is quite superior than the glass filters however the gelatin filters have some disadvantages and what are the disadvantages gelatin since it is a biologically obtained material it deteriorate with time everything deteriorates with time 
but the deterioration of the gelatin sheets is quite faster okay then since it is a uh, it is uh, hydrophilic in nature it is uh, the uh, properties of the films they get affected by the heat and the moisture okay then we are using organic dyes which are put into the gelatin sheets over a period of time there is bleaching of the dye and because of these disadvantages these gelatin filters they are not much used in developing uv visible spectrophotometers however they are a very good bandwidth as compared to the glass filters okay <clears throat> The last type of the filters, they are regarded as interference filters and they are also regarded as dichroic filter. They are also regarded as dichroic filter and they are the most superior quality of the filter and which have a narrow bandwidth of 10 to 15 nanometer. Okay. Further, the transmittance over here is in the range of 40 to 60 percent, which is considered to be very good transmittance. OK. In this case, what happens is that optical coatings or different refractive indexes are built upon a glass substrate. So there is a glass substrate and over that optical coatings or different refractive index, they are made in a sequential manner. Okay. In the next slide, I will show you what is happening over there. Uh, just understand what is the basic, um, what are the important points which you would be looking over there. Now the bandwidth of the filter can be tuned by controlling the thickness and the number of the optical layers which we will be putting. So which optical layers? As I said you over here, see there are different refractive indices which are built upon the uh, several glass substrates. Okay, And by tuning the properties of these um, different uh, optical coatings, we can play with the bandwidth of the uh, what you call uh, of the uh, wavelengths which we need to extract. Another important aspect over here is that the dichroic filters they do not get heated much, okay? Because if there is a heating, that heating may lead to the alteration in the uh, alteration in the performance of your spectrophotometer. Okay. Now here, in, if you see this last layer, it is the glass substrate. Okay. Then over there, if you see, there are different layers: layer one, layer two, layer three, and layer four. Now, from each of the interface of these layers, some of the lights, they are being reflected. Okay. And these reflected lights are of specific wavelength. Are you getting my point? So different coating, uh, different coating thickness with lambda by four and different refraction indices leads to the different types of wavelengths, specific wavelengths. Okay, specific wavelengths means band uh, of specific wavelengths of uh, specific bandwidth of wavelength. Okay, because as I told you, there would be some. Uh, dispersion say 10 to 15 nanometer so we cannot get say 1 nanometer then 1.2 nanometer and so on 
because in analog domain we can go for 1.0001 uh, resolution but it is not possible over uh, practically and so there would be whatever the uh, polychromatic system you develop you would be getting some dispersions however you can control this dispersion using the different types of filters including the dichroic filter okay so this dichroic filter they will they would give you the best um what do you call uh, best method to uh, what do you call to separate the different wavelengths okay with minimum dispersions <clears throat> so again spectral decomposition i already told you we can use prism which are made up of glasses so if you see white light is going on it goes and passes through the uh, this prism and then we get the dispersions so violet it is in the wavelength range of 400 to 420 nanometer indigo 420 to 440 nanometer blue 440 to 490 nanometer green 490 to 570 nanometer yellow in the range of 570 to 585 nanometer then orange 585 to 620 nanometer and then red we have 620 to 780 nanometer okay so these are the wavelength ranges of the different visible light components now once you have performed this uh, spectral decomposition then the slit is used by for calculating uh, sorry no, for obtaining a monochromatic light okay as you move this slit up and down so suppose if you move this slit which is over here if you move it vertically over here you will be able to extract the red light if you move the slit down suppose it is over here you will be able to get the violet light okay so in this way you can do it another important thing which you should keep in mind <clears throat> one of the important question which arises is that how narrow you can make the slit if you make a very uh, pin pointed uh, slit will it work you have to keep in mind that the wavelength which you are trying to use the order of that wavelength and the diameter of this slit they should not be similar the diameter of the slit should be greater than the wavelength of the light which you are using otherwise what would happen is that if the wavelength of the light and the diameter of the slit they are similar then instead of passing this light there will be refraction of light okay so you need to keep this in mind <clears throat> now there is another type of um, uh, element which is used for the spectral decomposition and that element it is called diffraction grating so if you see you are having this white light it comes it falls onto the diffraction grating and from there there is spectral decomposition and we again can use a slit to specifically um, collect a monochromatic light component i hope uh, till now i am uh, uh, i am i have been able to clear all your concerns if you have any concern please let me know <clears throat> now over here we have this schematic layout of conventional single beam spectrophotometer okay we have the light source the radiation 
it is going on it is falling on a collimator okay uh, it is basically uh, we can have a lens over here uh, what the lens does it is condensing the line uh, uh, light and it is condensing the light over the prism or the grating and then we are having the spectral decomposition and after the spectral decomposition we have the slit which acts as the wavelength selector now that specific wavelength of light it passes through the sample and then we have the detector okay so this is how a single beam spectrophotometer it would work okay in the case of reflective spectrophotometer this is a transmission spectrophotometer transmission spectrometer okay because the light it is being gaining entry into the sample and then it is coming out and then it is falling onto the detector as i told you there are another kind of spectrometers wherein this light it would fall onto the sample and this sample would be opaque and from there it would be reflected onto a detector okay now there are some certain disadvantages of this single uh, single beam spectrophotometer what is the disadvantage the disadvantage is that uh, we cannot measure the properties of samples and reference together okay so what is the problem over there initially what we have to do we have to measure the reference sample and after we do the uh, measure the reference sample then we go uh, for the analysis of the uh, normal samples or the test sample okay but it may so happen while you are working there might be some uh, changes in the environmental factors because in some cases your analysis it may go for say one hour or two hour and in between there might be a change in the environment so your temperature may increase it may decrease and due to the increase or the decrease of the uh, temperature what would happen is that there will be a change in the um, what do you call absorption properties of the radiations okay now if we concurrently measure the reference and the test sample together then that changes can be accounted for however this is not the case with the single beam spectrophotometer so in the current day spectrophotometers you will find that um, uh, in the most of the labs you are having double beam spectrophotometer okay then this is the schematic layout of a conventional split beam spectrophotometer it is also regarded as Uh, double beam spe uh, spectrophotometer so uh, this is the case for the tungsten uh, uv visible spectrophotometer so you have a tungsten lamp you have the d2 lamp this is the uv source this is the visible source similar arrangements can also be made over here light source over here i may i have combined it uh, combined it for both uv and visible but under the if you want to make it more specific you would be getting this kind of arrangement there would be one tungsten lamp one deuterium lamp they will be emitting light it will go to the mirror the mirror will 
uh, then condense the light into the monochromator where there will be an entrance slit. It will come over here. Then you will be having the spectral decomposition uh, unit which will decompose the spectrum and from the uh, exit slit, the monochromatic light, it would pass. Then there would be a beam splitter, um, half aluminized uh, uh, mirrors. So 50% of the light would be passed through the sample and the 50% of the light would be passed through the reference uh, with the help of this mirror. And then we have two photo detectors and then we do the um, data processing. What we do basically, we find out the uh, differential reading between the sample and the reference. Okay. And then based on that, we get the uh, absorbance spectra with respect to the change in the wavelength. Okay. Now, this monochromator, it moves. And when it moves, the spectral uh, decomposition, this thing, it it comes either down or the upside and while it is going upside uh, you will be getting this uh, the first part of this uh, violet one it is getting selected then slowly you will go towards the blue then green then yellow then red and then uh, red and accordingly you will be getting the uh, light over here so across the wavelength specific wavelengths you will be getting the uh, absorbance reading and as you scan through the different polychromatic radiations, you will be getting for each and every wavelength, you will be getting some absorbance outputs and from there you get this plot. Okay. So with this, I will stop today.